Okay, so uh, what we were talking last time, and uh, uh, I'm just gonna uh, try to uh, sketch that map, uh, what we were uh, talking about. Uh, so our lab right now consists of four uh, servers here, and uh, what we are ultimately going for is, um, yeah, you yeah, just, so uh, uh, here, uh, yeah. Uh, so four four uh, computers we have created, or four clones we have created. The purpose is to learn how to handle private cloud. So we are already, uh, you know, we know that uh, what is uh, cloud, what is public cloud. It's somebody else's data center that we can use, uh, like uh, Azure, uh, Microsoft Azure. And uh, also, uh, you know, uh, that AWS, so Microsoft Azure. So that's the public cloud by Microsoft, and then uh, this is it. Uh, and uh, then there is that AWS as well, uh, which are the market leaders, but there are <coughs> Google Cloud as well, right? So AWS is also Amazon Web Services. Uh, we talked about that last time as well. And uh, they are giving uh, one year free as well, AWS free tier. Uh, but uh, Amazon offers, uh, Amazon is the uh, leader in cloud uh, right now, having the, the majority of data centers, uh, while Microsoft Azure Cloud is the second, having most uh, data centers and most uh, customers. Then there are other uh, examples as well, like Google Cloud and uh, VMware Cloud as well. Uh, they also offer their data centers. Uh, what they all are offering is <clears throat> that you create your virtual machine, you create your virtual switches, you create your private network in their data center, and then uh, create as many virtual machines as you want. AWS is offering that, Azure is offering that, Google Cloud is offering that, uh, and you will see lots of, lots of other companies offering the cloud services. Uh, so uh, in the market, when you're looking for a job, uh, you will see that they would want you to have that knowledge of cloud, how they, how you can handle that as a system administrator, and uh, uh, what cloud uh, information you already have, which uh, version of cloud have you already, which company's cloud you have worked on. So many of the, uh, you know, uh, my friends and students are saying that when they're going in the market, they are being asked about, do you know anything about cloud? Have you ever worked on Azure, uh, Microsoft Azure, or have you ever worked on Amazon Web Services? So that's why it's very, very important for us to understand that this is the latest trend and companies are going fast. But we need to create our own cloud as well, or our own data center, uh, which has virtual machines, which has networking component, and which has, uh, which can offer any other uh, company to connect to our virtual machines and then try to create their own network inside our environment. Suppose we are offering uh, 400 machines here instead of four machines. So uh, all those 400, suppose these are the physical servers. So all these physical servers, uh, physical server here, here, these will be, um, you know, these can be offered to outside clients. Suppose you own those physical servers and they're very high end servers. Yep. So, do the servers have everything administered by the server? Mm hmm. And then you just give it to the client and the client can only do certain things. And one of the main purposes, right? So uh, we were talking about public clouds in the last class as well, and we were ta then now I was talking about private cloud. And they're having private as well. Hmm? Same idea. Same idea. It's just that uh, if you're able to put your workload, when we say workload, anyone understand what's workload? Uh, any virtual machine. Suppose you need five virtual machines for six months. And those virtual machines are accounts having account software. So you will go for the cheapest cloud market. So wh whoever offers you the cheapest rate 
for running your five virtual machines for next six months. You got a project for next six months, and you want to run that software. And uh, globally, some people are interested in using your software, and they're going to pay you a lot for using your application. So all you need is six machines. So if I had those six machines, I would just go to these cloud services, public cloud services. I would ask Azure, hey, I need it for five months, uh, six virtual machines. And they will be running 24-7. And uh, they will be, uh, so I'll be using 64 GB of RAM, quad core processor, and uh, sometimes I need uh, 128 GB of RAM, sometimes I need uh, even a 512 GB of RAM, not MB, actually, 128 GB uh, RAM, and sometimes I need even more. So if you say that to Microsoft Cloud, uh, they, those guys will give you a code for six months, right? So yeah, this is, is mm -hmm. exactly. So, we as a system administrator, we can handle the machines, and end users, we will just give remote desktop connection. Okay. So they will connect to the uh, accounting software, and they will just use it, and all they are concerned with is using it. But I'm getting a lot of money uh, by offering those five virtual machines, which have my own developed accounting software. Suppose this is the case. So I would go for the cheapest cloud uh, provider who can host my five virtual machines for six months. Uh, so uh, I would go for AWS, I would ask the same question, uh, five virtual machines for six months, uh, how much you will charge, and sometimes I need uh, you know, this much RAM, 128 GB RAM, sometimes I need five, uh, 512 GB RAM. So they will give me a quote as well that for six months we can just provide you uh, per month maybe one thousand uh, dollar. Some other uh, cloud will say, a cloud provider will say, I can give you in two thousand uh, dollar. Six virtual machines will be running, and Google Cloud might say some other quote. But the main thing is you're asking different cloud providers to run your workload. So that's called workload when you have a lot of uh, applications to run for a specific time, and they will use the hardware of the public cloud providers. So when I say hardware, what do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. Their physical servers, their disks, their memory, their processor. Yeah, public IP addresses. So they ha we have to access those virtual machines from internet, right? Mm -hmm. So they will be providing the public IP address so we could, through the internet, we can connect to their public cloud. After that, inside the cloud, maybe you have 20 virtual machines. So you can give their IP addresses separately. Uh, they will just give us the template which we can customize ourselves. So exactly, uh, that's why, you know, uh, Nowadays, there's so much uh, happening in the cloud, and uh, you don't need to buy your own servers. Although still it is expensive, uh, some people say that, uh, but companies see much more uh, you know, uh, uh, sp uh, spending money if they go for their own servers, their own physical servers, if they had to maintain that. They see a lot of expenses there to maintain a data center. So this will not be the case if they only have to worry about their virtual machine connectivity or access to the virtual machine. They just have to worry about that, right? So if they have to worry about that, they don't have to worry about, oh, machine will go down. No, we don't care about it. Microsoft experts are handling those machines, right? So, or AWS experts are handling those machines. Or Google Cloud experts or system administrators. These are big companies that have invested huge, right, in their data centers. So, uh, if we go for, so, so many companies are using, 3M is using their uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, and all, so many, so 90% uh, of Fortune 500 companies use the Microsoft Cloud. 120,000 new Azure customer subscriptions per month. So 120,000 new customers Microsoft are getting per month on the cloud. And Fortune 500 companies, uh, the top companies are, and there are 38 data center regions of Microsoft Azure only, right? So uh, this is a huge figure, and uh, if you're uh, seeing this, 120,000 uh, customers per month Microsoft is getting. Why? Because the Microsoft is offering so many services in the cloud, right? Like Office 365, which is uh, having millions and millions of customers. 
So, and, and what Microsoft offers, you can create virtual machines, just like the use case I just started that, if I have six virtual machines, five virtual machines with accounting software, and uh, uh, I need it for six months only, because it's a six month project and my client is paying me a good amount of money, so I would just go mark around which cloud provider will give me the best prices to run my five virtual machines for six months with uh, 512 GB RAM 24 seven, right? Uh, so I would just go for Microsoft Cloud and check the virtual machines here. I would go for AWS Cloud and check their uh, pricing for virtual machines. Uh, so they have lots of products as well. 750 hours per month of Linux, uh, 750 hours per month of Windows. Uh, Amazon S3 is the standard backup. Amazon RDS <coughs> offering SQL databases there. Uh, AWS Lambda. So we are supposed to know all these cloud providers and what services they're offering. Yeah. Security. Yeah, the huge amount of government servers are being hosted by AWS and Microsoft and Google Cloud as well. Not only government, banks also, so some of their, yeah, but normally they, they don't go for very security sensitive. They would go for all the workloads that uh, are less, uh, you know, they don't require much more security. So I, I would not think that they would just put everything in the cloud and they would trust that, hey, you know, AWS is, or Amazon is uh, protecting. They have their own data centers for most secure data, but whatever workloads they don't want to handle themselves, whatever applications, running applications and maintenance they don't want to handle themselves and has no security issues, so they would just push it to the cloud. That, hey, it's your data centers, why don't you just run it for us? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where we're talking about that uh, right now the trend is so common that uh, even if you want to run your own a small project, you can just uh, market uh, or market around and search for your uh, cloud provider who can just give you the least amount of prices for your virtual machine and applications that you want to run temporarily. You don't have to just buy your own servers. Everything is ready. You just have to uh, you know, start paying them and they will just provide you all the virtual machines there. Uh, so uh, keeping this all, uh, you know, keep an eye on all this and keeping that in mind that there are big players in the market in, in terms of cloud services, what services they're offering, application services, any application you want, uh, SQL databases you want to upload, uh, storages, uh, any amount of storage you want, one terabyte, one terabyte is already free for, uh, with Office 65, right? So cloud services, uh, then it comes down to your specific applications and uh, if you have your own uh, databases to upload or their database you want to use, Azure Active Directory for authentication, so authentication, so all kinds of stuff, you, can, you name it and they provide it. Like uh, whatever you can do in the, your data center, they're providing up there in the cloud. And that's for Microsoft, uh, same for Azure, they, they have their list of services here. And their terminology and naming as well as prices are totally different uh, because they have much bigger platform. And then Google Cloud, if you go for prices here as well, uh, so they have, they are offering pay as you go. Well, we talked about that in last class as well. But all the services they are offering, uh, we should be going there and trying to understand what kind of services any company would be interested in, what's the big deal about the cloud, why they're, the companies are all moving there to the cloud. What's, uh, why, uh, is really, uh, are they really saving a lot of money or not, right? So, uh, well, keeping that in mind, if we go to our setup here, and what we want to achieve from our course is that how cloud works. And we're, we're not only going to go to and check our public cloud uh, free uh, one month or one year subscriptions. We're gonna check how to create a cloud in your own environment. Suppose you wanna start your business uh, of cloud computing. You can just buy uh, five or 10 servers if you have good investment, good money. And then you can uh, install applications on top of that and you can then offer your servers to other clients who do not have their own hardware and they want some cheaper solution which is nearest. So we don't have to use the Microsoft one, we can set up our own? We can just set up our own business. And so many are doing that. 
Yeah. So we can just offer our own 10 servers in our two bed apartment, and uh, we can if we have clients. And so many people are doing that in their basements. They have huge data center, not huge, well, smaller data center because they already had some clients, and uh, they want the clients to trust them. They just offer their own home servers. Uh, as long as we are experts in maintaining those applications, client wants security and high availability, right? Always you're offering that your application will never go down and it will be accessible from all over the internet, wherever you go, and it's in secure hands, right? So if you're offering all this uh, with a lot of space, uh, of course, uh, uh, you can get clients. And so many uh, companies who had uh, different clients in different companies, uh, they used to send their engineers to different IT companies. Now they are uh, hosting their clients' applications in their own servers, right? So lots of businesses have changed. They are called managed services companies, and they just host, uh, you know, their clients' applications on their servers, physical servers, in Canada. Uh, so uh, the clients also are worried about, hey, all those cloud providers are in U.S., and uh, we want to keep our data inside Canada. So ho who are the local providers? So so there are so many local providers as well, and. That's where we are going with our four virtual machines that we created today. Uh, what is the purpose of that? We're going to create our own virtual environment, and we're going to try to uh, make it highly available. We're going to try to uh, make sure that it is performing best, and we're going to try to make sure that whatever uh, a public cloud provides can be provided on a very small scale. right? Uh, it's our private lab, of course. Uh, so all the hardware requirements uh, there. So this is this is the map of uh, typical uh, you know small network where everything is physical, physical uh, switches, uh, storage, physical storage here, uh, and then there's a management server here. Uh, so this is a, a, a you know a diagram of a physical environment. What we are intending to do here with our four clones is, if I just go to the diagram here. We're going to have a SAN of our own. So uh, we're going to have a small SAN uh, storage area network of and storage area network. So what does it do? It will provide uh, remote storage or, or LUNs, logical unit numbers, so uh, to other uh, physical servers physical or virtual servers to other physical slash virtual servers. So we're going to have one SAN of our own. How to create a SAN, what is SAN, uh, we're going to talk about that, and uh, why is it a big deal with all the public clouds uh, uh, computing uh, companies that uh, they want bigger SAN uh, that is uh, you know, having a lot of storage. So basically, it is providing you storage. But it provides on large scale and very fast and very secure, right? So, but we're going to create our own SAN. We're going to try to understand all the terminologies uh, when we are setting up that SAN. Also, there is that SCVMM, which is uh, System Center, Systems Center, Virtual Machine Manager. So, this is uh, a software by Microsoft that handles any virtual environment. So. It handles any virtual environment. So we are already in our lab. Uh, we, you know, have less RAM. Although I did ask about that, please upgrade, upgrade. But uh, there are some limitations in terms of investment or time. Uh, so the RAM is not there. But uh, we have to install still those heavy software. And uh, what, if, even if they are working slow, we just have to go for it. At least try to understand what they are. And in, uh, when you're creating a private cloud, what is the purpose of SCVMM? Uh, main purpose uh, in one liner, it handles any virtual environment, right? So specifically, this is a Microsoft software, SCVMM. Uh, so it will, uh, all the virtual machines that you create, uh, it's going to try to give advanced services, uh, high availability services, and performance and monitoring to those virtual machines. So this is one application that we want to learn. Uh, uh, SCBMM, then there is that SAN uh, uh, feature that is built into Windows 2012 R2, where local disks could be converted to iSCSI disks. So uh, this is another uh, very cool feature by Microsoft, uh, which could be used in the cloud. So if you go for 
you know it so send <coughs> send server inside Microsoft Windows can provide uh, uh, can convert first of all can convert local disks so suppose you have four disks you're using them locally in your server you're saving something there <coughs> so another guy says hey my server I'm handling that web server it has some web applications I need more disks so you're using just one disk out of the four disks you can just offer that other person three disks uh, remotely to be used so uh, what I'm trying to say here Microsoft uh, Windows can convert local disks into iSCSI disks and what does that do iSCSI disks you can offer local disks to any of the servers remotely right so uh, if uh, our exchange server uh, needs 200 disks we cannot physically put those 200 disks uh, in the server in IBM server or HP server I, I, I don't know if any server uh, HP Dell have came up with a server that you can insert physically 200 disks or 300 disks inside uh, physically maybe 28 disks maybe 32 disks uh, maybe 48 but not 200 300 disks right uh, otherwise server will be like a big room right so that's why we use iSCSI uh, to remotely access disks or hard disks which are actually physically present in some other machine right so SAN provides that storage area network NAS provides that network attached storage if we go for the next one network attached storage and we're going to test all those so NAS network attached storage so uh, this is cheaper than SAN than SAN so uh, these kind of uh, storages so you can go to Canada computers or any computer shop and you can buy a NAS enclosure which has uh, 10 disks or 6 disks or 8 disks but uh, you can just remotely offer those disks to any of the servers so what we want to do in our virtual environment here uh, for which we create four virtual machines that uh, we're going it's gonna get complicated and uh, we have to be very careful in our configurations that we're gonna be installing Hyper-V on these two machines here and then we're going to be uh, providing remote storage to them to these machines uh, just to learn how to provide remote storage so fourth server could act as a SAN server for us otherwise a SAN device if you uh, go out and buy it it's, it's expensive uh, but you can use any of your machine that has Windows 2012 R2 installed on it uh, you can convert their local disks into iSCSI disks which means those local disks could be offered remotely to any server which requires it right so you don't have to buy a physical disk for these servers maybe this one computer has its own 28 disks so you can just offer over the network, Ethernet network or fiber optic network, you can provide those disks to those uh, uh, two servers, uh, Hyper-V servers. So when the remote disks are available, uh, applications installed on top of those disks are secure. So if this server goes down, applications were never installed here. They were installed on a disk that is actually situated here but those disks are only connected over the network to this machine so that's why SAN, NAS are great in demand they require those skills hey do you know how to set up a SAN or a NAS device so they ask you that in the market as well uh, and you should know you should be knowledgeable about this so we're gonna try to cre create our own SAN and this is just Microsoft machine that can be converted into a storage area network there is EMC, uh, which is leader in storage market, uh, and there's NetApp that is a leader in storage market as well. Uh, those are big players in storage side, not in cloud side, uh, the storage side. So we're going to try to uh, at least uh, use one of the simulators of any one of those uh, big uh, storage providers because that will be useful for you in your uh, search for a good job.
So uh, Microsoft SAN, we're going to try that first. And uh, the, why it is so important? Why are we following Microsoft Private Cloud? Uh, in, uh, you know, just to learn how cloud works because it is widely implemented as well. Microsoft Cloud. There are two exams for that by Microsoft. Two certifications for that. Microsoft. Uh, uh, you know, those companies which have a lot of Microsoft servers, they expect you to know. Uh, how private cloud works, and can, they do ask, uh, you know, if you're an MCSA, Microsoft Certified uh, Associate, so or uh, SE, Microsoft Certified Expert, uh, so they will ask you, hey, can you configure a private cloud? So the course follows this example, but we're going to go for other examples as well uh, from other companies as well, uh, just to get, you know, gain more knowledge and uh, experience on other products. So uh, what we are trying to do. Four machines. One would be SAN. Uh, other would be SCVMM, which is System Center Virtual Machine Manager. Uh, there is a System Center product, uh, 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 you know, family of products. Uh, there are many System Center products, and one of them is this. So System Center products. So they are many of them are used in the creation of a private cloud. So uh, system center, there is COM, system center, operations manager, there's SCCM, system center, configuration manager, and then there is that SCVMM, there is uh, system center, operations manager as well. Uh, <coughs> so there's many products from system center from Microsoft, ultimately, Microsoft is creating all those products. Uh, but we're going to be using SCVMM for our implementation because cloud is all about virtualization. It's a virtual environment. If we can create our own, and we can handle our own private virtual environment, then we can offer the same environment uh, to others as well as a private cloud, right? Hmm? Yes, exactly. We should be competitors to Microsoft as well. Definitely, we should think big. Definitely, we can just come up with our own environment and offer it to others. Uh, so many institutes are doing that. Uh, in CCI preparation, so many other colleges are offering those, uh, you know, pods for connecting remotely and uh, you know doing their work, and they're earning good money. Uh, so, you know, it's all about hardware, and you can you handle that hardware? Can you make it highly available? It's all about that. So that's what we are going to learn that uh, uh, the, in the virtual environment. Can you really handle that? Can you make it highly available? Can you make it performing very well? You get to start your own business, right? Uh, if you are that good in virtualization and uh, especially the cl uh, private cloud. So, uh, if we go ahead a little, but before that, uh, um, I also wanted to. <coughs> okay, so pro uh, this is a physical network that's the slideshows. This is our network that we were in the process of creating uh, uh, from today, and you're going to see some more complicated uh, configurations coming. Uh, so uh, today we just uh, kept it light. Uh, we had a small lab, uh, and we are taking time. Some students uh, did have a problem, but the majority did not. So we're good with that. So uh, processor requirements, of course, it has to be either Intel or AMD. And uh, whenever you buy a new laptop or a server, uh, this Intel VT or virtualization technology, or if you're buying AMD based, uh, it should be offering virtualization or Hardware assisted virtualization should be there always. Uh, if you buy a new computer and you start installing a virtual machine, it's going to not work. You have to go to the BIOS of that computer or uh, laptop and then enable that Intel VT first. So, hardware should uh, support the virtualization, right? So, the processor should uh, support virtualization. So, that's why processor requirements uh, are crucial uh, when you're trying to set up your private cloud. A uh, multi-core processor is a single computing component with two or more independent processors called cores, right? So two or more independent processors. So the more processing power you have, the better speed you're offering to your clients in a virtual environment, right? So dual-core processors uh, has two cores. Quad-core processors contain four cores. Hex-core processors contain six. So performance improves when cores are shared between virtual machines. So performance is improved when you have a lot of processing. That's why it's initial investment uh, that you go for very high-end servers uh, that then you are able to offer private cloud to others for longer time. 
uh, the better the server, more clients will uh, install their applications on your servers, right? Remotely. So uh, you can even buy used servers from the market uh, as long as they're high end, uh, they're cheap as well. You don't have to go for fifteen, twenty thousand dollars per server. Uh, in five thousand, six thousand, you can get a good used server as well to offer as a private cloud. So memory requirements, amount of memory required is determined by the number of virtual machines that will run concurrently. So at one given time, suppose you have a client that says, hey, I have 10 virtual machines, they're all accounts, applications, and I want them running 24 seven. You cannot take them down. If they're down, I lose business, I lose business, you lose business. So if you're offering the cloud, uh, you need your private cloud to be uh, offering high availability to all the virtual machines. If you lose one physical server, uh, the other physical server should take over and keep the virtual machines running. And that's not easy to uh, achieve. Uh, you need to go through complicated uh, configurations to make a uh, virtual machine highly available, right? So we're gonna do that through Hyper-V and you're gonna see that it's not <coughs> that difficult as well, but there are so many steps to do that, uh, to achieve that. So uh, we're gonna do a crash test as well of our machines uh, just to check if virtual our virtual machine is highly available or not. So uh, standard for determining memory overhead of each virtual machine. So what is the standard of determining uh, what is the memory overhead per virtual machine or how much memory you should be buying. So start with 32 megabyte for first one GB of virtual RAM. So virtual RAM is used for virtual machines. And virtual RAM is accessed from the physical RAM, right? If physical RAM you have 32 GB, then virtual RAM you have to go with uh, whatever is available uh, in the physical uh, hardware. So this is the uh, you know uh, you, you know the, uh, the determining the standard of determining that start with 32 megabyte for first one GB of virtual RAM. So virtual RAM is for virtual machine. And you can start with, okay, how much RAM should I give it to one virtual machine? So uh, if virtual machine, if there's an application that requires 32 GB, if there's an application that requires 32 GB, so you install an application server two here, it requires 32 GB. So uh, if you have a total of uh, 512 GB of RAM, then you can easily assign that, uh, according to this 32 MB for first GB formula, you can assign like 64 GB uh, at least to that virtual machine so it could survive uh, any kind of performance degradation. So add eight megabytes for each additional GB of virtual RAM. <coughs> so this is the formula here that you can assign to each virtual machine. Uh, but you know when you're offering business or you join a company that is offering that uh, private uh, cloud to other clients. So you will have to determine, so uh, the, the boss asks you, hey, how, which kind of servers should I buy? So you will have to go in the market and try to check uh, the memory requirements and processing requirements of the server uh, as a system administrator when you get a job there. So, uh, and virtualization is everywhere, so you have to know all these standards and uh, you have to uh, decide or a company will invest according to your, the information you're providing, right? So uh, you have to go through this, these standards here uh, and some of the concepts that we're about to discuss, uh, like uh, uh, hypervisor, we know that, but parent partition, we haven't discussed that, uh, number of virtual machines. So there's a table here, but we haven't discussed some of, uh, suppose, uh, especially this parent partition, what is that? So uh, while we are determining what is the hardware, I'll just revisit that uh, concept of uh, you know uh, the one terminology that came to our um, view, which is parent partition. So how does hyper, uh, hyper uh, hypervisor gets installed? How does it distribute its tasks uh, to other uh, you know? Uh, if there are five virtual machines, how does it distribute the task? How does it distribute? How does it let the virtual machines use the hardware? Hardware is only, you know, if there is just 64 GB RAM, only 64 GB RAM, and there are five virtual machines, they will all want to share that 64 GB RAM. So how does hypervisor intelligently let the virtual machines use equal amount of RAM, or whichever virtual machine you have reserved 
the RAM for hey, one virtual machine will get uh, 16 GB, other virtual machines will only get 8 GB. So you have to uh, reserve all that, and uh, hypervisor has to intelligently decide uh, which virtual machine will get how much memory, right? So uh, we, we talked about making the uh, cloud transition in the uh, last class. Advantages, we talked about that. Then server virtualization, we talked about that. Uh, uh, so we're going to just go ahead a little, and uh, because we need to cover today is this week's topic as well. Uh, so what I'm passing by is storage resolution. We talked about that. NAS, RAID. So and LUN is a logical unit number, a unique identifier. So if you have a remote disk, it is called one LUN. So if you need five disks, it's like okay, five LUNs or logical unit numbers. I need to uh, remotely to uh, have some enough data storage, right? So storage virtualization, we talked about that. Uh, I'm just gonna try to, because I recorded the previous lecture as well, you can just see or listen to that in the previous recording as well. Um, but I just want to go to that topic directly. Clustering, so we didn't discuss about that. Clustering, connecting multiple computers to make them work as a unified system. Clustering, load balancing, and redundancy and failover. Four terms that are System administrators are always familiar about, you will be asked in the interview about these terms. Uh, what is clustering, what is load balancing, what is redundancy, what is failover. So if you are able to offer these four features in your private cloud, your business is going to go high, right? Uh, more clients will be coming there according to the reputation. If you are making, uh, if you're making sure that machines are clustered. Clustering means connecting multiple computers to make them work as a unified system. So clustering just offers that if one machine goes down, the other machine keeps the show running, keeps the application working fine. Suppose you install on top of it, uh, you know, that uh, a hospital enterprise application or accounts uh, application, so that application, if it is uh, installed on top of a clustered computer, so this means it can bear the loss of one computer, one physical computer. So clustering offers, yes, offers high availability and redundancy. So, and what it does, it fails over. So that was a term also used there. What it does, it fails over to the surviving machine. Uh, in case of loss of one physical server, uh, uh, the uh, cluster fails over to the surviving server, right? So uh, these High availability terminology. These terminologies, if you are offering all these, of course, you must be an expert in that and you must have invested a lot. Uh, so, clustering, load balancing, redundancy, and failover. Uh, this is what we want to test in our environment as well once we are uh, able to configure it properly. Uh, then we go ahead a little role based security. So, provides finer control over permissions in a virtualized environment. Of course, you have to. Uh, keep your environment very secure, and uh, those who are allowed, who are not allowed, authentication. So you will be providing triple A uh, in most of the cases. Anyone knows what's triple A? Accounting. So you will be providing triple A, so security and high availability, right? So AAA accounting authorization and uh, authentication. Authorization and accounting. So other than high availability, it's the security you're also concerned with and you will be providing that. So if we go ahead a little here, role-based security, of course, who gets access, who does not get access, you have to provide that. So many areas of the private cloud you have to be concerned about when you're uh, configuring them apart from the hardware. We already talked about examples of cloud computing. One is infrastructure as a service. 
uh, service provider pays for servers, network equipment, storage, and backups. So you provide, uh, so the data centers are provided as is, or the servers are provided as an infrastructure. Uh, somebody else's servers you use when you're using IaaS infrastructure service and platform as a service. We talked about that. Service provider offers business solutions for users. Uh, so platform as a service, uh, you can have a development software there. You don't have to worry about the physical servers, uh, but you still install your own applications and uh, then configure them and develop them. But software as a service is where the ready-made applications are available for you, right? So uh, this is the diagram that also shows that classification. Uh, On-premises, you have everything you have to handle yourself, but then infrastructure platform and software, you handle very less of everything uh, until you go for the software as a service. Hmm? This here? Uh, standalone? Uh, so these are, this is the public cloud, right? Which is being provided. This is your own data center where you have to handle everything. So it is just uh, depicting that uh, green ones are the ones that uh, you will be handling. You don't have to worry about virtualization, server storage, networking. Here you don't have to worry about all this, just the data. And here just the software itself, right? So uh, then we were talking about computer hardware requirements. So in our environment, uh, we haven't yet installed DHCP here. Uh, we will be needing that later. Uh, today, we just went for a basic configuration, Active Directory, DNS, and we joined the machines to the domain. Uh, but later requirements are those software that we're going to be slowly installing and properly configuring. Uh, so it, it, it is uh, requiring that uh, NAT and DHCP should be there. Uh, so we're going to be installing that later on certain uh, virtual machines only. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. SAN? DHCP? No, SAN, a SAN machine, so fourth machine will be the SAN. It, so it is used just for offering its local disks to other machines, to other computers. So its local disk will be offered to other computers. So DHCP will be used just if you're creating virtual machines inside this these servers, those virtual machines need an IP address. So DHCP will provide. So we just need it for... Hmm? For high, on top of a hypervisor, we're going to be installing virtual machines. So if I go to the uh, visual diagram here, so here I could just explain better. Uh, so suppose these are our four servers here, and uh, so we're going to be installing on top. This is our four virtual machines or clones. So on top of this, we will have hypervisor, which we have now. And inside the hypervisor, you're going to see that uh, the virtual machines we're going to be deploying one after the other. <coughs> so inside the hypervisor, two virtual machines are there. Then we're going to try to migrate the virtual machines while they're started from one clone to another. Uh, we're going to try to uh, take down the server as well and check if this virtual machine is still available, highly available, even if we lost the server. And uh, it, it, is, it will start running on the other virtual uh, environment or other uh, physical server, right? In our case, it's the clone. So we're going to try to test all that. But main thing is we're going to create virtual machines inside our Hyper-V. And those virtual machines need DHCP IP address. Yeah. So DHCP will be actually installed here on the first server, which is DC, DNS, and DHCP, right? This is the domain controller will have a DNS server and the DHCP server. Yeah. So hypervisor will be using. So let me just show that DNS DHCP is there, right? Now hypervisor is installed here. So once hypervisor is installed inside the hypervisor, so what is the purpose of hypervisor? To host virtual machine. That's the only purpose of hypervisor, right? So if hypervisor is installed, so uh, inside the hypervisor, why was zero? Okay, that's a new spelling. Uh, so inside the hypervisor, we're going to be installing this virtual machine. So first the hypervisor application here on the server, which is already there now, today. So inside the hypervisor, we're gonna install virtual machine one, virtual machine two. And that virtual machine, either we can give static IP address or 
this DHCP can, from this server, it's going to contact this virtual machine and provide an IP address there. Right? <coughs> so, yeah. So, one hypervisor goes down, the virtual machine should be highly available. Right? So, it should just move there or it should be, it can be started here. <coughs> right? But it, we're going to be talking more about this map and uh, explanation as well. So, uh, week one has some conceptual slides, but week two is totally lab slides uh, that explains that what, why we are installing the, those labs and what do we, what are the objectives we need to achieve from there, right? So uh, week one had some requirements, networking re requirements. If we go for to complete la lab activities, uh, we need to know the following networks. So there's a management portion of the network. We have just installed Hyper-V. But we will be talking about, uh, after Hyper-V is installed, we're going to be talking about all these components one by one in the lecture later, after we have configured much more of Hyper-V in the week three lab. Then we're going to go for all the areas, which I'm going to uh, show you as a demo in the lecture lab. Uh, where I'm going to go to each area and try to uh, you know, explain what this area does, what, what virtual switches do, what uh, virtual machines, how virtual machines can be connected to uh, Hyper-V. We're going to do the lab, but we're going to try to understand in the lecture lab with my demo. So uh, we're going to be creating network requirements. So we're going to be creating switches here. Uh, if we go for my uh, diagram here, the switches will be uh, created on these two servers. So uh, one virtual switch here, second virtual switch here. And these virtual switches will uh, connect our uh, machine, our virtual machines to each other and to the outside world. So all our, experiment, uh, all our experimentation will be normally done on server two and three, right? So server two and three will be uh, having main Hyper-V roles. Here, server one, server two, and server zero three. So on top of these servers, inside these servers, we're going to be going for virtual switches, which are of three types. Uh, we're going to go through the types as well. Then we're also going to go for uh, uh, you know installing, connecting applications to these virtual switches. So inside the this virtual machine, it's going to look like this. One virtual machine here one virtual machine here, right? So two Hyper-V, having virtual switches, which we're going to understand how they work, what are the VLAN, you know, there's VLAN feature, there are other features inside the virtual switch, and then how these virtual machines are communicating with each other, right? From here to here. So all this uh, we have to uh, do and properly configure inside server two and three. Server so 4 is sitting there offering its local disks only, which we already discussed. So we're going to put some disks there, and these disks will be offered uh, to these server 2 and server 3 as well. So, yep, sorry. Sorry, again? V Center. But vCenter is from VMware, and that's a separate company. And as an alternative for vCenter, we have the SCVMM here. vCenter is in VMware. SCVMM is from Microsoft, which does the same thing as vCenter in VMware. Virtual switch, uh, this is the same concept in every virtualization. So. Citrix is another company that offers virtualization. It also has virtual switch. Uh, any cloud provider, you go to Azure, they have a virtual switch there. You go to Google Cloud, they have either infrastructure cloud, IAS, IAS, they have virtual switch there. So whichever is virtually providing any machines, they're offering virtual switches. Yep. What are the licensing costs for installing this on Huge. So, is it kind of the same? So, SCVMM has its licensing cost, and you have to pay a lot for that. So, it depends on you have uh, 2,000 machines. Uh, 
or uh, 50,000 machines. So it gives you, Microsoft gives you a code for that. And how many virtual machines SE, VMM will be? So, so if you go for vCenter, yeah, it's it's huge so amount of time. Oh, okay. So either per user or per virtual machine. Okay. Mainly it's per virtual machine. That how many virtual machines you're so that much license. So if there are ten thousand virtual machines, you're gonna it's gonna be a usual cost. It will be like per month or per year, some uh, amount of licenses or volume licenses will be available. But it's not just virtual machine per user as well. Uh, okay. And last question, mm -hmm. is there a way to do that the, the licensing dynamically? So I want to install a virtual machine over this infrastructure. I contact you, put one, two, ten, however many, and that automatically goes to Microsoft and says, okay, we're going to include ten more, add that to our license. Is it so? Does it have to be done before, or can you do it as the customer comes in and gives you one? So that's a very good question. Public cloud, it's done automatically. I mean, as your requirements increase. The licenses will be provided. Okay, so In private cloud, no, you have to well, buy it before. Yes. So your environment will only earn money for you if it is a little bigger, right? So if it's a small environment, you know, like 10, 20 servers. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we are using still Microsoft products, right? To offer that. There are open source products as well. Yeah. Okay. Where you will not have to pay, or the payment is like nearly, you know, free. Exactly, nearly nothing. It's already there as well, open stack. So this is an open source cloud as well. Open stack is free. It's it's like not free. It's very very cheap. Performance, yeah. What you know, you get what you pay for, right? So, <laughs> but Open stack is offering just just like against Windows 2012, Windows. <coughs> so Microsoft is providing some high availability and performance and reliability. So bigger companies might not go open source because of you know those risks there, uh, but those who cannot pay that much will go open source, and there are thousands of companies who are going open source. Yeah. It, it is working fine. It is working perfectly as well. So we're gonna try to check the open stack as well. This is another terminology, but we are we're not yet there. We're just creating our own environment right now, and. Uh, this is a business use case, like uh, if you create this environment, can you sell it, right? So we have to make it the, uh, make it like that, that we can sell it at home if we create that environment. You can ask others, hey, you want to create a virtual machine, I'll just let you connect to this virtual, uh, to my virtual environment, and you can just start and stop one virtual machine or two virtual machines. I'm just going to charge you $10 per month, $10 per two months. Uh, you can offer it free for you know two or three months. Then, of course, you if you provide better security, you will charge more. But uh, basically, we're going to create our uh, uh, you know private cloud, and then we're going to try to sell it as well. We're try we're going to at least try to make it as a professional one. Uh, so when you create it at home, you can actually offer it to others. Hey, do you want to run your one virtual machine, two virtual machine, three virtual machine remotely? I'm going to give you a remote desktop connection. Go ahead, use it. Right. So if that if you're able to do that, yes, then it, there's a benefit for this. And that machine, when you're offering, you need to have all the services available. It should be highly available. And if you take down the host, it should migrate to the other host, yeah. physical host, the and the performance and security. <coughs> so that's why we're going to go one by one just to create that use case of offering it to others as a business. right? So if you can offer it as a business, uh, you must be professional on this. Uh, so that's what we're going to try to practice. OK, guys, so uh, let's go ahead a little. Here, networking requirements, we're going to be talking about. Uh, so I'm going to show you as a demo once we have our uh, Hyper-V up and running. So storage requirements, 
of course, uh, we have one server that is dedicated to offer storage here, SAN, right? So this server, its local disks, you can offer to other servers over the network, right? So if those local disks are uh, being offered, and you know how to do that technically, you know how to make them uh, available 24-7, you're an expert then uh, in uh, offering that storage, right? So each, you know, there are multiple features that you have to be an expert on just to offer a private cloud to other companies or other small clients or just to your friend who's sitting at his or her home and you're offering, hey, just remotely connect to my private cloud and start this virtual machine and use it for one week. So if you're able to do that, you're, you're, you're going towards creating your own business, right, for private cloud. <clears throat> so uh, for that, we need to understand all the concepts about SAN as well. Microsoft Windows 2012 R2 offers that uh, uh, built-in SAN connect uh, service, so your local disk could connect, uh, convert to uh, iSCSI disks. And the terminology for SAN is there are initiators, and there's a target. So there are two uh, terminologies there. One is initiator, one is target. So what is an initiator? Sorry? The server two and server three? Or the SAN one? Oh, whatever. No, it's not the SAN. It's So, yeah, so there has to be one, in a SAN, there has to be one target and other initiators. So what are initiators and what are targets? Initiator. So initiators are requesting the hard disk. Target is offering the hard disk. Target is sand. Initiators are which are getting the hardest. Exactly. So uh, we have to. We must understand this uh, difference. Initiators are getting the hardest, and target is the sand that is offering the hardest. So I can just put it here, uh, offering the HDDs or well, in in storage term we call it LUNs. They are offering uh, logical unit numbers here. And these are uh, borrowing the LUNs or hard disks, remote hard disks. Not borrowing, borrowing. <coughs> so target offering the LUNs, SAN is offering the disks, and initiators are requesting the disk. Hey, I need the disk. So you're the initiator who's requesting the disk, or you're the target if you're offering, or if your machine is offering the disk, right? So. Um, let's go, uh, so here on storage, we have to identify who's the target, who's the initiators, and who will require the disk, who will offer the disk. Uh, so these terminologies are very important in virtualization and in cloud uh, computing that you must understand that when we are talking about initiators and uh, targets. So, uh, so initiators uh, allows clients called initiators to send iSCSI or SCSI commands to SCSI storage arrays. Uh, supports the storage requirements for the lab activities in the textbook. Well, the main thing here is initiators will request the disk. That's what we, we need to understand here uh, when we're going basically uh, uh, to uh, you know configure the whole environment, SAN environment. Then we're going to be um, you know uh, configuring this. So uh, computer software requirements. Uh, we already have Active Directory, Hyper-V, DNS. We have just configured today. We haven't configured failover clustering yet. So failover clustering, it's, it's uh, quite complicated already. Uh, that failover clustering saves you from a host, loss of a host, loss of a full operating system. So failover clustering, it fails over the application uh, from one host to another. So Windows failover clustering is also the requirement written here. Uh, design failover clustering designed to allow servers to work together as a computer cluster provides failover and increased availability of applications. Redundancy, exactly as we said. So uh, then it says System Center Virtual Machine Manager (SCVMM), right? So SCVMM is just like as you said, vCenter in 
Uh, VMware, anyone used vCenter? You had a whole class on vCenter. You used it. Sorry? Yeah, that's what we talked about. No, that's the one. Today? Yeah, Windows 2012 R2, we installed it, but we did not install this one yet. Till now. VMM? No, we did not. It's a very difficult application to install. No, no problem. Oh. Okay, guys. So uh, let's just go ahead a little installing the management server. So SCVMM will be managing just like vCenter manages in VMware. SCVMM manages in uh, Hyper-V environment, right? So installing the management server here. Okay, too many emails coming. Uh, now it also says about the uh, other requirements in the private cloud. Uh, so what else we need? Active Directory we installed today. Uh, did we install Active Directory today? We all did, right? Active Directory, right? So we, then DNS got installed uh, with it. Hyper-V, we installed that today as well, right? Provide scalable, reliable, and available virtualization platform. Uh, so we did that today already. If you go ahead, um, well, it just explains Active Directory domain services. So we, uh, we know that it offers authentication, authorization, and counting. So. Uh, we can just end it, offers logon authentication. I'm just going to skip that slide because Active Directory concepts are already basic concepts that we already know. Uh, so, and group policy, uh, this is, well, it also provides that, which handles the whole environment, but we just have to go ahead. DNS for name resolution, we already have it. Now, Hyper-V hypervisor. So, Hyper-V role consists of several components. Hypervisor, parent and child partitions. Virtual machines and guest operating systems, synthetic and emulated devices, integration services. So what are those? <coughs> so here, uh, hypervisor core component of Hyper-V, responsible for creating and managing isolated execution environments called partitions. So why do we need partitions in Hyper-V? Hmm? Resource sharing. So first partition. Uh, well, it's a little different than that. <coughs> hmm? Yeah, so partitions, let's uh, try to see why we use that. Guys, one thing to remember here, that first partition of hypervisor. So you've just installed Hyper-V. The first partition is used to talk to the hardware. So first partition talks to the hardware directly. The second partitions are all considered as virtual machines, right? Second partitions are all called virtual machines. First partition is called parent partition. So you install hypervisor. It automatically installs the parent partition. What does parent partition do? What does parent partition do? Parent partition talks to the hardware on behalf of the virtual machines. So parent partition talks to the hardware. What, what do you mean by talk to the hardware? Parent partition talks to the hardware, right? It talks to the memory. So if virtual machine needs a memory, this request will go to the parent partition. Parent partition will talk to the memory. Hey, memory, uh, virtual machine one needs uh, some of the RAM. So the memory will be provided through the parent partition to the virtual machine, right? Second virtual machine needs processor. So second virtual machine will talk to the parent partition. Hey, parent partition, can I have some more? Uh, can I have 50% of processing of your uh, uh, you know, total processing yeah, that you have? So parent partition will forward this message to the hardware. Uh, can we have 50% processing from the hardware uh, to that second virtual machine? So parent partition, which gets installed uh, primarily with the hypervisor, so it is responsible to talk to the hardware on behalf of virtual machines. Virtual machine needs memory. They will talk to parent partition. Yeah. They will talk to. Yeah. So virtual machine needs hardware all the time, right? RAM, processor, disk. So how would they request virtual machines? How would they request? No, whenever they need 
then they will request, right? So whenever they need to request, virtual machine need to request, they will talk to parent partition for that. So parent partition is part of the hypervisor itself. No, I understand. It's a child that always has to go back to the parents. Like exactly. Bingo. You know, so virtual machine cannot directly talk. Why has the parent? No. no. Only in very rare conditions, rare conditions, that is called pass-through disk. Yeah. There is one uh, feature called pass-through disk. Virtual machine disk directly talks to the hard disk without any middle guy. Yeah. So in rare conditions, yes. When virtual machine really need performance, yes. Otherwise, it's the parent you have to talk to. Parent partition you have to talk to. Oh yeah, that's coming, that's upcoming. Pass-through disk is another topic here, yeah. which is upcoming. But this is the basic uh, concept, that uh, hypervisor, Hyper-V hypervisor has a parent partition that gets created as soon as the hypervisor gets deployed. So that parent partition talks to the hardware on behalf of virtual machines. Virtual machines need any memory processing disk. They have to talk to the parent partition. Hey, parent partition, I need that. Parent partition talks, yeah, whoa, whoa wait, oh, yeah, sure, I'll just wait, uh, arrange it for you. So it arranges that memory or hard disk or processing for the virtual machines from the hardware. That's the main task of the hypervisor, right? There has to be a middle guy, hypervisor, but it, hypervisor for its own working does not take a lot of memory processing or hard disk, right? It, so if there was an operating system, operating system does the same thing. It also offers, you know, it's a middle guy, operating system, but hypervisor for its own working, uh, it does not need a lot of memory. So that's why hypervisors are preferred when you are uh, hosting virtual machines there. Either ESXi hypervisor from VMware, Hyper-V from Microsoft is a hypervisor, uh, Zen server from Citrix is a hypervisor, KVM from Red Hat Linux is a hypervisor. So they're all offering hypervisors, right? So uh, Zen server from Linux, uh, from Citrix, and KVM from Red Hat Linux. So these are also hypervisors that offer the exact same, the logic is the exact same, but they don't call it parent partition there. They just call it their own terminology. They have their own terminology for that. <coughs> so yeah, this is the concept for parent partition uh, that it talks on behalf of virtual machines to the hardware. Uh, if we go ahead a little, <coughs> uh, there you go, it says that. So uh, hyper hypervisor loads for the first time, it creates a parent partition, as we just discussed controls all hardware devices and is responsible for allocating physical memory to the partitions. Directs the hypervisor to create and delete child partitions. Child partitions do not have access to physical hardware. They go through parent partition, right? So, well, uh, this is the concept of parent partition. Uh, operating systems installed within child partitions are referred to as guest operating systems, of course. We know that. So guest operating systems are installed inside child partitions, right? So virtual devices exposed to guest operating systems fall into uh, two broad categories. So when you have a virtual machine with a guest operating system, when you have a virtual machine, so if I go to the virtual machine here, uh, it has Windows 2012 installed inside. So Windows 2012 installed inside. Now this virtual machine is working here and uh, uh, it is running on top of a hypervisor here, which is Hyper-V, right? So what other components it is, what other devices it is uh, accessible, it is accessing right now? It is accessing emulated virtual devices, software implementation of typical PCI device. Appears as a physical PCI. So uh, there is that uh, physical memory, there is a virtual memory as well. Uh, there is that uh, CD-ROM there, there's a virtual CD-ROM there as well. So uh, anything, any hardware that is physical, there's a virtual alternative for that hardware as well, right? So that's the same, if you, some of you have gone to, through the uh, VMware course as well, right? So you will see a lot of similarity between VMware virtualization and Hyper-V virtualization because the basic concept is still the same. If you go to Citrix Zen Server Virtualization, you will see the, that names are changed, interfaces are different, concept is exactly the same. Again, 
somebody, there has to be a hypervisor that talks to the hardware on behalf of virtual machines. So all companies offer hypervisors. The basic concept is still the same. Some offer better services, some offer more services, some offer a little less services, but, uh, and they are less reliable, some are more reliable. Basic concept still comes down to the same. So you will see some similarities there, but some uh, specific uh, uh, you know, features that are not there are here as well. So that's a good time to compare. But if you have done the virtualization uh, course of VMware, that's a very good background to creating a private cloud because cloud is all about virtualized uh, you know, services that you offer to others, right? So if you are able to create yourself, uh, that's really cool as a business use case. So we're going to try to treat it as a business use case so you could offer at home, uh, create a private cloud of your own, and offer it to somebody uh, for one week, one month, and uh, it should be highly available, secure, and fast. Uh, virtual machine. Well, whichever anyone falls for, <laughs> whichever price, but nobody's going to pay like that. Five dollars per month. Five dollars? It, it's even cheaper than that as well. So we last class we talked about DigitalOcean. Uh, that's the cloud that uh, for specific. If you're using specific RAM, specific processor, just this much RAM, five twelve megabyte RAM only. If you're using for one month, it, they're just going to charge you five dollars. So it's not regulated. Hmm? It's not. Regulated, but it's not no, whoever offers the best prices, but. So cloud providers have some regulations, but uh, not everyone. There is an open stack that th where the services, the prices even go cheaper, or much bigger services are cheaper, which uh, the public cloud, commercial clouds are offering. So, uh, so those devices, there's there's a virtual side of that devices as well. So uh, emulated uh, virtual devices, synthetic virtual devices, only function with Hyper-V and are also implemented in software. So Hyper-V specific devices, virtual devices are there, and then there are overall uh, CD-ROMs and you know even virtual floppy drives there uh, that is emulated there. So operating system just thinks that, oh, I'm running on top of a physical machine. Operating system is fooled into thinking that, right? So uh, Hyper-V hypervisor, there are some more technologies coming here. A communication mechanism between partitions. So we did know, we did talk about that uh, there's a parent partition that is responsible for uh, letting virtual machines, which are called other partitions, uh, uh, virtual machines uh, letting a, a parent partition let the virtual machines use the hardware, right? But how do they talk to each other? How does the parent partition talk to uh, the child partition or other partitions, right? Uh, so this is what how they explain it. A virtualization service provider, VSP runs in the parent partition and directly communicates with the hardware drivers. So there's that uh, first component uh, of communication, uh, VSP here, virtualization service provider, runs in the parent partition <clears throat> and directly communicates with the hardware. While virtualization service client, there is a VSP service provider and then there is a virtualization service client. What does that do? Runs in the child partitions. So VSP runs in the parent partition, and VSC runs in the child partition, and presents the virtual device to each child partition. So uh, if we go for VSC here in the diagram, so VSC just provides uh, those uh, virtual devices. So if virtual machine needs access to virtual CD-ROM, VSC, VSC does that. If a uh, virtual machine needs access to a virtual switch, any device, right, virtual floppy drive, then VSC does that. So uh, VSP is on the parent uh, partition, VSC is on the child partition. And they are communicating through that to each other, and hence virtual machines are talking to each other for, hey, I need this much memory, hey, I need this much uh, processor, through these mechanisms, through these services. So uh, each VSC has a corresponding VSP in the parent partition. So uh, VSC is in the virtual machines. It communicates to the VSP, hey, VSP, I need that. You know, Can I have 8 GB more memory? So VSP says, oh, let me talk to the mem physical memory now. 
So, oh yeah, I talked to physical memory, yes, you can have a GB mode. So, how the virtual machines are talking to each other, how the child partition is talking to the parent partition, it's through the VSC and VSP communication. It's gonna be so much uh, nice to have these in the quiz. Okay. Upcoming quiz. You're not gonna give give quiz. You're, you're making me cry now. Oh, okay, thank you. thank you. So, but no, don't worry about that. So, uh, VM bus, the third uh, you know uh, terminology here, point to point memory bus is used for communication between VSP and VSC. So, how does VSP, the parent partition, and the VSC, the client partition, how do they communicate with each other? through VM bus. So that's the point to point memory bus is used for communication between. So uh, we just need to know the major uh, you know, terminologies here, VSP inside the parent partition and VSC in the client partition and they communicate through VM bus here. Uh, uh, th these are the major terminologies that they're using in the diagram as well uh, just to make sure that how hypervisor, uh, hyper-V uh, virtual machines communicate with each other and to the hardware. So these are the internal mechanisms through which they communicate with each other. Uh, now, uh, enlightenment, integrated services. So Microsoft term given to implementations in virtual environments that reduce overhead and improve guest operating system performance. So that's, uh, Microsoft just call it enlightenment where you can improve performance. What is integration services? So integration services is, you, can you restart the machine? Can you shut down the machine? Can you uh, start the machine? Can you move the machine? So those are integration services that are provided by Hyper-V. Um, so there are those portions in Hyper-V. We haven't started the Hyper-V yet, but this is how Hyper-V uh, looks like from inside. Surveyor pane is there, information pane is there, and actions pane is there, right? So when you start a Hyper-V, uh, this is the areas, these are the areas called surveyor pane, uh, where we can just see all the list of virtual machines that we have, or all the list of Hyper-V uh, physical servers we have. So it's gonna all show up here. Information pane is where, if you click one hypervisor only, uh, Hyper-V, uh, whatever virtual machines are inside, that Hyper-V will show, if you click Hyper-V here, its virtual machines will show here. And what do you want to do with those virtual machines? What are the options you have on, uh, on the hypervisor? What else you can do is on the actions pane here, right? So uh, these are, uh, this is the area of Hyper-V. We're gonna be using throughout the course this Hyper-V as well as some other software as well. And uh, it's gonna get a little complicated uh, with uh, the coming weeks. So. Summary again, and this uh, could be in the quiz as well. Okay, no quiz. So, uh, for now, uh, so cloud computing. <laughs> yeah, so majority is a third. Who wants quiz? Who wants marks? Let's put it that way. So, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, marks, 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 marks. It's like, you know, cards game. Uh, nobody wants a Nobody wants? Nobody wants? Wow. Where to go, man? He's not even listening. So let's hit him with something. Okay. Especially some, you know, burger or... Okay. Seriously. No, he's again back to headset. So... Oh, it's recording. Seriously. So... Okay guys, so uh, the next slide is all about, which was week two slide. I'm just gonna fly by it because, uh, uh, but this is information you must know if you're going to do the next lab, because uh, it's gonna use some of those terminologies that we're about to discuss here, uh, especially how to create virtual hard disks, especially how to create virtual switches, uh, virtual machines, and operate the virtual machines. So this, we, ha we are going towards that, uh, today we have uh, gone towards just installing Hyper-V Manager, right? So later we're going to be in next lab. What you're expecting is 
uh, creating a virtual machine that will have its own virtual hard disk and virtual switches. So we're going to create multiple virtual switches just to understand what is virtual switch. How does it work? What are the components of a virtual switch? And then uh, if you're good in switches, anyone done CCNA already? You're also? Studied the course, CCNA? OK. We no choice. Oh, yeah, no choice. OK. They had to do that. They made you do that, right? They didn't make this, but, they didn't but this make is how yeah. you have to go ahead, right? So this is very, very good, very, very important. So you know then physical switches how they work. Now virtual switch, and you know virtual switches from VMware class as well. But you can just compare that how the virtual switches work here in Hyper V. <coughs> and then uh, we're gonna go cloud as well to just to check there how the infrastructure is working there. So. Uh, once uh, these are, this is the uh, you know objectives of uh, you know the upcoming uh, week. So uh, create virtual hard disks, uh, create virtual network switches, and configure virtual switch machines. Operate virtual machines, right? So uh, I'm just going to go. Oh, you're writing again. You're writing the objective. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you the slide. No, but I, uh, I, I won't remember what you said. Oh yeah. So we're going to do that next week. What? These these objectives, yeah. So Hyper V Manager, operate, we have just installed it. We just reached the, now we're gonna to configure the whole Hyper V, right? So that will be coming uh, next week. <coughs> and yeah, you're, you won't be able to finish the lab in 45 minutes. So many students were able to finish the lab in like one hour. So the next hour we were like looking at each other and you know, what do we do now? Like this. So now you're not gonna get that time. Da, da, da. Okay, so anyway, uh, let's just go ahead. Uh, operating, uh, operating Hyper-V Manager. So th that's what we're gonna do next week. Uh, we will operate, yeah? Break? You know, last class I gave the break, what happened? Nobody came back. <laughs> Nobody came back. <laughs> so, no, no, it's, uh, the, I was thinking, hey, uh, oh, 406. Hey, is it a long break now? <laughs> okay, five minutes break. Zooming, uh, what uh, objectives are we <coughs> uh, expecting in uh, the week three? Are uh, operating the Hyper-V manager, create virtual hard disks, expect a longer lab, much longer. So create virtual network switches, create and configure virtual machines, operate virtual machines. So uh, this is the whole uh, Hyper-V that we have installed. In, uh, well, actually all the servers have Hyper-V installable. We're gonna install it on server two and three, right? So, uh, and then we're gonna just try to uh, explore all the options as shown here. Uh, when we are creating a virtual machine, much of this will be explored automatically uh, when you're creating a virtual machine. But we're gonna go for, uh, you know, configuring switches as well and uh, all the other areas. So there's that uh, new virtual machine, import, Hyper-V settings, Virtual Network Manager, Edit Disk, uh, Inspect Disk. So about the disk, how much you can maintain, do the maintenance for a typical virtual machine disk. Uh, this is, uh, we're gonna go through that. Operating System, Operating Hyper-V Manager, Stop Service, Remove Server, Refresh, View. So these are typical options that any software would have. Nothing big here. Then two categories of Hyper-V settings. One is server settings, and other is user settings. So specify the default location of virtual hard disks in the server settings and virtual machines. So where would the virtual hard disks be residing? And that's where the, if you're a storage aware administrator and you have to be, if you're in virtualization, you must know how the storage works. So when you're deploying, wow, what a mess, okay. So when you're deploying your virtual machine, at that time it's going to ask where are you putting your hard disks, VHD. So uh, a virtual machine hard disk is uh, always uh, dot VHD or dot VHDX, right? So virtual machine hard disks are having these extensions and you have to really make sure that hard disks are the ones that are always, always available, right? So virtual hard disks, Hyper-V virtual machine, 
uh, hard disk extensions are .vhd and uh, VMware virtual machine uh, uh, hard disk extension is .vmdk. So .vhd or is so when we talk about .vhd, it is uh, Win 2008 uh, OS Hyper-V. So it's the older Hyper-V uh, virtual machine. Uh, if you have Hyper-V installed in 2008, its virtual machine hard disk extension is .vhd. If you have uh, Windows 2012 based, so Windows 2012 uh, VM, its hard disk extension is .vhdx, right? So we must know that's different because many large companies have uh, old Hyper-V as well as new Hyper-V deployed. So you should know the difference. .vhd is the hard disk extension of Windows 2008 uh, Hyper-V virtual machine. .vhdx is the uh, hard disk extension of Windows 2012 uh, based uh, Hyper-V virtual machine. So uh, if you know this difference, uh, uh, you can do maintenance on the hard disk. So all the important data of customers, your end users is placed inside these .vhdx's or .vhds, right? So uh, if we are able to know how to expand it, how to edit it, uh, if uh, we lose it, how to uh, get it up and running again from backup, then we are doing disaster recovery, right? So server settings specify the default location of virtual hard disks. Normally what happens when you create a new virtual machine, uh, it asks where to put the hard disk. So definitely uh, we're gonna be, we're introducing a fourth machine as SAN. Uh, this means remote, uh, remotely the iSCSI disks over the network will be available. From SAN machine, it's going to offer us uh, it's going to offer us remote disks. So these disks will be showing in these Hyper-V machines. If the disk actually is residing here and it is showing here, so when you're installing virtual machine, you can place that virtual machine's .vhdx on top of a remote hard disk. As soon as you place your virtual machine's vhdx on top of a remote hard disk, that hard disk actually is residing here then. Virtual machine is running here on this, and that hard disk is residing here, right? So over the network, hard disk is securely placed in a remote machine called SAN. So uh, that's what uh, we're talking about, that if you are placing your uh, hard disk, are you placing it locally on that server? On this server hard disk, you're placing the hard, uh, virtual machine's hard disk, or this remote server's hard disk, you're placing your virtual machine's .vhdx. So if you place the vhdx of this virtual machine on this server, if this server goes down, you lose that hard disk. If you're placing your virtual machine's hard, vhdx on this server, of course, if this server goes down, the vhdx is still secure. It's still safe. So that's why uh, SAN is so important. You have your data highly available. It is safe, right? Uh, of course, your, your SAN should have hard disks that are RAID protected. RAID 1 or RAID 5, RAID 10, RAID 50 protected SAN should be there. And there should be regular backups going on on the SAN. So everything should be protected here because this is uh, where the actual data of your end users is, right? So uh, user settings, customize interactions with virtual machine connection, uh, how the users can remotely connect to your virtual machines. You have to provide that connection. If you are providing a private cloud, you have to give your public IP address of your company or if you're, if you're running from home, your home DSL router public IP. You have to provide it to uh, the other clients. So we are trying to make a home uh, private uh, cloud and we want to sell it to others uh, that if others can connect to the, it or not. So of course, uh, you will be worried about what is your public IP address, right? To change settings, click Hyper-V settings in Actions pane, in Navigation pane, that appears, click setting. You want, so if you want to change settings, you go to Hyper-V settings, but we're just talking about it. Uh, I, would be, I will be showing you the demo next time in the lecture as well, uh, but you're gonna be doing a long lab there as well. Uh, now, Hyper-V settings on the host server. So virtual disks, uh, you can just put the path. This is the local path, but we will be 
first giving the local path, then we're going to give the remote path so we could know the difference between SAN provided paths and uh, local paths, right? Then there are virtual machines that, of course, we need to handle every, the whole virtualization environment is revolving around protection of virtual machines, right? So whatever you're doing in high availability, you have to make sure virtual machines are up and running because end user is concerned with the data that it is securing inside virtual machine, right? So then there is that NUMA. Only thing to understand about NUMA is that it provides virtual machines direct access to memory. Or NUMA normally provides uh, greater direct memory access to virtual machines. So NUMA compatible uh, hypervisor, uh, Hyper-V is a NUMA compatible uh, hypervisor. This means that uh, virtual machines of hypervisor will be uh, given much direct access to the physical memory, right? Uh, so uh, this is what NUMA is all about, uh, giving direct access to physical memory to the virtual machine, right? So. Uh, this is uh, another Hyper-V settings uh, uh, window that shows this uh, NUMA spanning virtual machines and virtual hard disk. So there are many, uh, in order to understand uh, hypervisor, of course, we have to uh, go to each and every area of the hypervisor and try to understand all the terminologies there. Uh, ESXi hypervisor is as complicated as uh, Hyper Microsoft uh, Hyper-V hypervisor or Citrix Zen server or uh, KVM from Red Hat Linux. Those all hypervisors, they are complicated. They do, the basic concepts are exactly the same. So we were talking about types of virtual disks uh, before as well. So dynamically expanding is thin provisioning. We all know what is thin provisioning. We are coming from virtualization course. So thin provisioning, it does not occupy the whole space. Uh, it just occupies what you install, right? So fixed size is thick provisioning which is if you give uh, 200 GB to the hard disk, it occupies the whole space, by the way. And differencing is a concept in, well, this is the feature in Hyper-V. This means that if you add another disk, so there's a parent disk and there's a child disk in differencing. So after you introduce the differencing disk, uh, whatever you install now, or whatever you modify in your operating system now, will be saved in the differencing disk. So hence the name differencing any diff so once you introduce the differencing disk, any modification. So after introducing the differencing disk, you install MS Office. So that's a change you're doing on the operating system. That whole change will be saved on the differencing disk. Hence saving the space of your parent disk. Your parent disk will never run out of space then if you introduce that differencing disk as a child disk, right? So differencing this just saves whatever modifications you've done from today onwards. You installed MS Office, you installed any application, uh, everything will be saved automatically to the differencing disk, right? That's why the name differencing, right? Any modifications onwards will be saved in the differencing disk. Then the pass-through disk, this is where uh, a virtual machine can have direct access to a physical disk. That's a very cool feature, that's what we were talking about pass-through disk. Uh, this is called RDM, raw device uh, management uh, in uh, VMware, RDM. And here it is called pass-through disk in Hyper-V, right? So pass-through disk, physical disk mapped directly to a virtual machine. So virtual, if you are installing SQL Server or Exchange Server in a virtual machine that requires a lot of IOPS of the disk, then you go for uh, providing a pass-through disk to that virtual machine. So it directly accesses that uh, physical disk, and hence, if it is a SSD disk, it gets huge performance out of that, right? So pass-through disk, <coughs> and so yes, creating a virtual disk, we're gonna create that, no big deal about that. Either dynamic or differencing or fixed size, right? So when you're creating that, uh, so these are the, this is the picture that shows the, what we just discussed, fixed size, dynamically expanding, differencing disk. Uh, so uh, this is what we're gonna create. We're gonna try to understand those features. We already discussed about this. Now here is the path for that uh, uh, virtual disk. Normally the path is local, C drive. But after we introduce the SAN, we're gonna carefully change the paths of the virtual machine. So the virtual machine dot VHD, 
So true or false, uh, VHD is the hard disk extension of virtual machines on Windows 2012. Oh, okay. Is that it true? Good. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and uh, create a new blank virtual disk, 127 GB. And now copy the contents of specified physical disk. And this is the remote path backslash backslash. Yeah, it is. I, I understand it is for 47. So that was like a big announce, loud announcement. Come on, teach. Give it up. Oh. Hmm? Huh? It's only 445, right? Okay, it's only 445, right? So <coughs> we have only a few slides left. 47. Okay, we're counting. Okay. So, um, editing a virtual disk, uh, that's where you need to know uh, if .vhd is in trouble or if .vhd is running out of space, uh, you can expand it, uh, you can inspect the disk as well. But the main thing is that uh, if it is running out of space, uh, the clients are upset and you need to make sure that the, you can expand the already being used disk. The client is already using that and there's a risk there, but you have to expand that, so how do you do that? Uh, so editing a virtual disk, compact, convert, expand, merge. These are all the things you can do to a virtual disk. You can make it compact, applies to dynamically expanding and differencing virtual hard disks with the new technology file or NTFS. Reduces the size of the .vhd. Nowadays, now we are just talking about .vhdx. If it says HD, so we're going to assume it's .vhdx because we're working only on Windows 2012. We're not working on 2008. The slide is uh, older. Uh, the concept are still the same. So uh, we can compact the disk. We can convert the disk. Converts are dynamically expanding virtual disk to fixed size. So convert converts the disk from uh, thin provision to thick provision, right? Expand. Yep. Well, it depends. The requirements change, right? So maybe you created a thin provision, and then you need performance now. So you convert it to thick provision. Maybe uh, that server was not meant to have performance. Uh, maybe it was a web server. Then you install SQL Server as well. Now it needs real huge performance. You'll convert it to thick provision then. So requirements change, right? We never know when the requirement comes. So expand increases the storage capacity of a dynamically expanding or fixed virtual disk. Merge applies only to differencing disks. Use this option to combine changes stored in a differencing disk and the contents of the parent disk. So merge is that you want to combine the changes that were uh, you know, saved on the differencing disk. Expand, the word says it, it's gonna expand the size. Convert will convert from thin provision to thick provision. Uh, and, but you cannot convert back from thick to thin, right? You can, it's only one way. So, and compact just reduces the size. So we can play with, not play, but we can just uh, do some maintenance with our .vhdx disks. And you should know that, how to do that, because once you're stuck with that, uh, once you're given that task from the boss, and you're not able to do that, that's a very bad impression, right? So you should know how to troubleshoot uh, any disk-related errors uh, inspecting a virtual disk. So inspect is a very cool feature. It gives you a lot of, it gives you some uh, facts about the current hard disk. What is the size? Uh, what is the size? What is the maximum size of this disk? Or how big it's going to get? And is it a .vhd or is it a vhdx? And where is it located? So inspect disk is offering you that information. So virtual network switch. Uh, that's what we're going to create uh, in the next week and I'm going to show you some demo here in the lecture uh, uh, you know class as well uh, right now I'm reading it but then I'm going to show you the demo and how to create it and I'm going to record that whole thing while we would have done the lab already for that because labs are first and lecture is after so uh, but we can just uh, uh, so there is that virtual network switches now that's a bigger topic that needs uh, you know uh, a lot of uh, time. I want to sketch it as well. Um, so we're going to continue with this uh, in the week three.
while we're going to be doing a much longer lab now uh, in week three, we're going to be configuring all that uh, hard disk, virtual machines, switches, and we're going to be talking about that. I'm going to put some explanations while we're doing the lab, but then we're going to understand uh, what steps we have done. So virtual switches, we have to really understand uh, perfectly because that's going to communicate between virtual machines, uh, between them and outside the world with those virtual machines. So guys, uh, let's uh, <coughs> try to wrap it up. Uh, virtual switches is the main important topic here that uh, needs a little more time. If I start quickly just to finish time, uh, you know, uh, you're not going to understand that. So, and we're going to create virtual switches just to uh, understand what other features it has. All right, so I'm just going to stop the video and going to put it on the blackboard. <laughs>